and welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything else along the way. I'm your host, Brian Broom, joined by Greg Ettinger and Emily Maxson. Today we are talking about um, a thorny topic, probably, uh, eminent domain. Uh, so we're going to be talking about Naboth's Vineyard. And what, Greg, why don't you start us off? Well, I don't, actually, I'm going to have Emily start us off because in my original article on this, I referenced, it was 2012, a movie from Disney called Wreck-It Ralph. And Emily it's says such it's, a one good of her, movie. it's such a good movie. So she's going to tell yeah. us about it and how this leads into our topic. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on the spot. Well, Wreck-It Ralph is the bad guy in a video game. He is trying to fight off fix it Felix, except he's not fighting him off. He's protecting the property that was taken from him, except that's kind of backstory to the video game. If I recall, I'm not telling this very well at all. I'm telling you, it was like 10 years ago that I saw this movie, (laughs) but it was really great. But the, the player of the video game plays as fix it Felix, and he has to go and fix everything that wreck it Ralph has wrecked. But in the movie, wreck it Ralph, realizes that he never gets a, a, a gold coin, a recognition that he's cool. Like all the other video game characters, because they're heroes, they earn these little tokens. And the, that's, you know, it's related to how the video game players would, I don't know, win achievements or something. And he's like, you know, everyone hates me. And I think it's because I don't have one of these achievement tokens. And so he leaves his video game and goes into other video games trying to win a token so that he will be liked. And as you might guess, that's not what ends up happening because that's that's not what makes you liked is your achievements. <laughs> it's a good movie. You should watch it. <laughs> it's got music by Al City. What more could you want? Well, true. Um, speaking of that, music at the end has lyrics that no one ever pays attention to because credits are rolling the stories way over. But if you listen carefully, you're told this about Ralph. He was minding his own business on the day they came. They showed a piece of paper saying, imminent domain. They built an apartment building saying progress was to blame. So he got mad and he turned bad. Brick by brick, he's going to take his land back. Imminent domain. And Brian was suggesting to me earlier that they threw that in at the end for parents who might wonder what in the world was going on in this movie. Kids, <laughs> I'm sure kids don't understand the term in eminent domain. I'm not sure that many parents understand it either. Well, how often do you ask why the villain in a video game is doing the thing that they're doing? Well, if you're playing fancy video games from the last decade, sure. But not if you're playing like the original hardcore arcade games. Then the, the Wreck-It Ralph just wrecks. That's just who he is. And if you're a kid, that's enough. <laughs> you go like, ah, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. he's Wreck-It Ralph. That's how he do. <sighs> Nobody asks why the ghosts in Pac-Man are chasing Pac-Man, you know? Right. And, yeah, right. Everybody right. asks where is Waldo. No one asks how is Waldo. <laughs> no one shows any concern for him. Whatever. All right, let's get back on topic here. The point is <laughs> this little phrase, eminent domain, it's a legal term. It has to do with the right and authority of a governing body to acquire the land of one of its citizens because said governing body needs it more than the citizen does or some other citizen or corporation or industry needs it more than the citizen does. Sometimes it's because we need to put a freeway through your living room. Sometimes it's because we need to build a pharmaceutical industrial complex uh, right through your house and your neighbor's house. Uh, Maybe we need to run some kind of water pipe right through there. Whatever it is, it is something that obviously is more important to the community at large than whatever you're doing with your house, which presumably is living in it, or your business, which presumably is, well, running a business in it. And and so uh, this is an established principle of American law, and it's written into the Constitution, though not under those words, that the federal government cannot take land unless it pays appropriate compensation to the owner. There doesn't seem to be any question as to whether or not the federal government should have the right to take away property. It just does. 
and here pleading conservatism or traditional American values is not much help. Um, there are two uh, instances, and I'm, I'm not a legal authority on this at all, <clears throat> but I can present you with two. One is Kilo versus New London, 2005. Suzette Kilo sued the city of New London, Connecticut, for giving her home to a pharmaceutical company in the name of economic development. She argued that it was unconstitutional for the city to take private property from one individual or corporation and give it to another. The United States Supreme Court, so this became a federal issue, an appeal to the, the Constitution itself. The United States Supreme Court disagreed in a five to four decision. The court announced that public purposes qualifies as public use, as it's described. In the Fifth Amendment. So here's a lady who Garbage. lost. Yeah. That, is, <laughs> that is such specious reasoning. Because <laughs> you could also make the same argument that because it's public purposes, that, oh, well, uh, yeah, I, I sell timeshares to the public. So that's a public purpose. Right. Well, I mean, the, the person living there presumably contributes to their community by being a person in that community. That's just that's as public much purpose. public person <laughs> purpose. <laughs> But some per some public purposes are greater than others, it seems. The second mm -hmm. case involves the Brooklyn Nets, a basketball team. New York real estate developer Bruce Ratner discovered a choice piece of partially undeveloped land in Brooklyn, perfect for luxury high rises. But 14 acres of older businesses and homes stood in the way of any sort of redevelopment project. Ratner needed those structures condemned, so he fastened it on a traditionally sanctioned public use for otherwise questionable property, and that public use was a stadium for his basketball team. And so he bought the New Jersey Nets. The city of Brooklyn jumped on board, exercised the power of eminent domain, and handed off the land to Ratner. This is 2010. But then came this thing called the recession, and Ratner suddenly couldn't pull off his plan. He had to rearrange his capital. Uh. And that involved selling the Nets, who were supposedly the purpose for having the stadium, and scaling back his building plans. So he went ahead and built stuff anyhow, not a stadium. He still ended up by his own projections with an annual return of 10%. In other words, he made good money off of it. Not, a tr not as much as he hoped, but it was worth his while. And those people who had old homes or businesses in that area lost them. Now, they were paid at whatever um, the city took to be fair market value which of course is always debatable. How much is a thing worth? How much is it mm -hmm. worth to you? How much yeah. money are you willing to take in place of it? How much willing, money is someone else willing to give you? Which of those is the fair market value exactly? If we want it more than you seem to want it because we really want it, you kind of really want it. You know, where, where, where do we draw this price line? And um, you don't want to sell, when, that's just that's When just one bad. party has no power to walk away. Yeah. It's impossible to have a true negotiation there you go. of any yeah. kind, even if it were attempted. It, it all becomes hypothetical. Where if there were somebody living there who did want to sell, I'm sure they would be satisfied with this much. That's what other land in other places is going for when people want to sell. I don't want to sell for that. Well, yours being ornery. So the public good comes first. Anyway, that's eminent domain. It is the thing. It's not a recent socialist invention. Its roots are in the Constitution. But we've gotten really good at elaborating on those principles and, and pushing it into ways that even our founding fathers didn't plan on. And we and, might even suggest that just because it's in the Constitution doesn't make it right. Doesn't make it right in the first place. There's some other economic things we could talk about someday that are in the Constitution that don't make it right. Interestingly enough, the Bible does not have a, a high opinion of uh, eminent domain. For instance, well, you know, there's that commandment about stealing stuff and not, <laughs> not, not, <laughs> yeah. also not steal. Uh, uh, yeah, I believe the words were do not. Yeah, do not. Yeah, yeah. No. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, but that only means you shouldn't steal unless it's good, unless it's better for everybody else if you do, right? Ah, so utilitarianism is Yes, the kicks in, you know. I was reading one of uh, Thomas Sowell's, uh, a really good book earlier. I forget the name of it at the moment. Uh, he, of course, is a conservative with libertarian leanings, but a conservative first. 
and I was reading his defense of private property. And there came a point where he said, yeah, well, ultimately, yes, private property, individual property, individual property rights, except ultimately they're founded in the social compact that creates the state. So if the state needs it more, it really can't take it from you. And that's just the way the system works because majoritarianism and all that lock and wait, what? <laughs> it's, he, it's a wonder. This just could... seems like very much a, uh, an argument based in shifting sand. Yeah, well, it is. It absolutely is. Who I was, defines need? Who defines the greater community? Uh, yeah, There's just a lot to wiggle there. Who defines value? Who defines worth? Oddly enough, God thinks he does. Uh, <laughs> what being, gives him the right? Who yeah, died being, and made him God? Yeah, well, now that's an interesting <laughs> question on so many levels. That's an interesting way to phrase that question as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was uh, teaching Sunday school one morning on this very topic. I don't remember if it's exclusively this, but it got to this. And I was pointing out this simply, this is theft. The government does not have the right to take its citizen's property. And I thought I was being rather black and white. The state does not have the right to steal property because thou shalt not steal. I was rather surprised, nay, even shocked, when one older gentleman who has served in the church for years and who's certainly no stranger to either politics or economics, raised his hand and said, now, surely you don't mean, and I don't remember his exact example, but it was something along these lines, there's this community here and you're over here and your land runs, the, runs right through the water uh, where the water needs to go to get to them. Uh, you're not saying that they can't acquire your land so that this larger community can have water. And I went nonplussed thought I had shifted into an alternate universe and <laughs> not wanting to make a fuss over this and say, when did you become Marxist? Um, said simply something along the lines, <laughs> well, I, there may be things in the Bible that I have missed, but I would need to be shown them because as far as I can see, the Bible and he, he, I got some kind of response, and I think our friend David Farshman also responded about the same time saying, what the? Yeah. Thank, <laughs> by the way, David, thank you for standing up at that point. Um, well, there's an interesting thing there, because there's two principles that are at play at the same time. The first is that the government is bound to respect property and not mm -hmm. steal. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, individuals especially Christian individuals, <laughs> are called to uh, acts of charity and love mm -hmm. for neighbor and neighbors. Mm -hmm. I think that there is a, a type of bond, binding necessity, binding morality in favor of allowing that sort of action, but it is not the government's job to enforce that at the same time. Yeah. yeah. It's forced charity is no charity at all. At all. If they're exactly. taking the taking your land at gunpoint, that's not really <laughs> yeah, that's not an charity. act of loving your neighbor. That's being burglarized. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, 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 but I do level. appreciate Brian what you're saying. Is is it right mm -hmm. for Christians to sometimes to say, I am really not doing much with that land. Uh these people on this other side do need the water. I can. I don't need to to milk this deal for all it's worth. I can accept something. If I if I had planned to sell it my own, what would I ask for? Oh, maybe something like okay. I'll take that. I'm even take a little less because I'm a good guy and I want to help out my fellow citizens. That's great. Mm -hmm. But as Emily says, when the government comes and holds a gun to your head and says, "You don't get an, uh, a a yes or no here, nor do you get to set the price. We will set the price. We will take your land." And, yeah. and so I felt I, in this instance, I just fell back on mostly what I was. I, what I said is, show it to me in the word of God, um, and and then quickly ended the class because we were near the end at the time. But it, it was very surprising to me in someone who who is most certainly politically conservative, who knows the Bible well, that such a thing should just pop up without some kind of argument or a preface or have you considered or have you thought or something like Brian just did, well, what would you do in this in these circumstances? Couldn't a Christian you know, willingly let go of his property, mm -hmm. let go of his rights? Well, there's a lot in the Bible about letting go of our rights for the good of others. Mm -hmm. But you have to let go of rights, and to do that, you have to kind of acknowledge that they're rights. 
there's legal permission and authority from God that yeah. other people can't simply take from you because they think they have a need that's bigger than yours. There are, war there are warnings in Scripture about rich men piling up riches and not considering the poor, hoarding the, the, the crops that they've gathered in when people want to buy them. Yeah. But there is no permission to the king or anyone else to go simply take the stuff. In fact, we mentioned thou shalt not steal. You could also go with what Jesus said in the parable of, of the vineyard. The, the vineyard owner says, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Like, sell it or not sell it? Hire you or not hire you? Give you a bonus or not give you a bonus? As long as I'm Funny you should my mention a vineyard. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. um, and, and then when we come to, um, speaking of vineyards, when we come to the original quest of Israel for a king, Samuel, God said, tell them the kind of king they're going to get. <laughs> and he said, among other things, he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. That was considered a bad thing. <laughs> this king will exercise him in a domain over your property, and he will take it away from you, and he will give it to his servants. That's not good government. That's bad government. That's well, tyranny. And especially in the Old Testament uh, national Israel economy, which looked forward to the coming of Messiah and also put great stock into family inheritance as you know how you are remembered throughout mm. time it's like mm. if you didn't have land to give to your children a you would not be remembered because your your lot would not be in the promised land mm -hmm. uh lot quite literally in this case mm -hmm. but also you would be considered a functional failure as a father as a provider mm -hmm. because you don't have land to give to your children yeah <laughs> And you've lost the ability to give them their lot in the, the in the promised land and be remembered. So it was especially heinous to have a ruler come and say, "Oh, I'm taking this land, and it's not even going to your relatives. It's not going to your kindred. It's not going to your children or your grandchildren or their grandchildren. It's going to this guy that I really like, who's cool because he told me my hat looked nice." Yeah. No. Sorry, it's just a game. <laughs> yeah, and how much do you think the king is going to honor Jubilee? <laughs> yeah, well, that was the next point. In yeah. Jubilee, land was supposed to revert to its original owners. That probably wouldn't happen in this situation. Because God uh, had given the land, right? The, yeah. God had pointed out for each family, and that's incredible. Like, God knew who I was and gave me this land. Yep. Mm -hmm. And he knew who my children would be and their children after them. Uh, at least till the coming of Messiah, and they did not know what would go on beyond that. But yeah, Brian's um, getting ahead of us and much to the point, because when we this text that we're coming to, which has to do with Naboth's vineyard, Naboth does not explain a great deal of why he won't sell, and to us it can just look like well, stuffy capitalist who has covetous designs on his land and won't won't sell to someone who has a reasonable market offer. Now, sure. everything that Brian just said goes here. This is a religious issue. This is a cultural issue. This is an issue of inheritance, not just of property, but of place and of, of remembrance and of holding things together the way God ordained until Messiah should come. So it becomes a big, a big deal. So much so that in the Restoration Covenant, as Ezekiel looks forward and prophesies, he says this. This is Ezekiel 46, 18. Moreover, the prince shall not take of the people's inheritance by oppression to thrust them out of their possession, but he shall give his son's inheritance out of his own possession, that my people be not scattered every man from his possession. The ownership of land was a big deal. And although in the New Covenant we are not commanded to have land, we certainly have many good examples of it being a good and useful thing for many people. About the only place where in the New Covenant where we see this principle uh, kind of jettisoned is in the, the early church after Pentecost when everybody sold their land, but they sold their land for a really good reason. It, 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 within 40 years, the market value would be below zero. Uh, <laughs> Jerusalem was about to be destroyed, and therefore the land no longer meant anything. But mm -hmm. until that, had Israel been faithful and received their Messiah, then presumably those land tenures would have gone on or been used by the church or something. Because God would not have had to destroy everything to make his point. So, 
uh, in terms of, of even the prophets, a godly kingdom is where the king does not take your stuff and give it away to his servants or his sons. You get to live on your land and farm your land because it's your land from God. Now, of course, what we're assuming here is we, these are things we've talked about before. God owns everything. Yes, obviously. And just as clearly from scripture, God delegates property, including land, to individuals who are to take it and use it for his glory. They're to develop it, they're to dress and keep it, to use the language of, of Eden, uh, to exercise dominion over, to be stewards, to use the language of Jesus' parables, to take what we have and, and improve on it and make it better and then pass it on as a covenant inheritance. This is basic. Uh, there's nothing unbiblical, unloving, selfish, ungodly about any of this. This is, in fact, the way God presents property throughout Scripture, although uh, as Brian says, it the emphasis was much stronger in the Old Covenant because the land was special, the land was promised, the land was holy, because that's where Messiah was coming, and they, Israel had to be there. And God implanted deeply within them a consciousness of that particular land and had given it to them. And interestingly, you, you kept saying Lot. He gave it to them by Lot. That's where the word Lot comes from. We have lots of property. We have lots that make up our property. <laughs> <laughs> because once upon a time, property was designated by lot. They cast lots to see who got what. Um, so God's fingerprints are all over this thing. Now that brings us to 1 Kings 21, and I will read some of the text here. It came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it's near to my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it, or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. Now, that's not necessarily a wicked offer. Although in light of everything we just talked about, it's, it's, Ahab yeah. <laughs> is kind of acting like God, saying, oh no, I will take you away this land and yeah. give you a different land. Like he has authority to do that. Well, he if you read it in the most generous context, it would mean mm -hmm. you will lease it to me long term until the Jubilee, which was allowed, not mm -hmm. particularly encouraged, but it was allowed. And and the understanding being, I will I will lease it to you for the from you for the rest of my lifetime, which might be another forty years or so. And if the jubilee had happened recently, that might be all the you know jubilee would revert everything. And in the meantime, I'll give you something just as good, or I'll give you money. Now he says, buy it from you, and so again, that's putting the best possible construction on it. If he literally means I'll buy it, and your family will never get it back, then yeah, that crosses boundary lines real fast. But whatever the case, at this point, Ahab is making an offer. There's, there's no sword behind it, no threats, just, I have a good business deal for you. But Naboth says, the Lord forbid me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to thee. Now, that's all we get from Naboth. And, and what we talked about earlier, what Brian said, is the background that Naboth is assuming. And if you've read the entire Old Testament to this point, we should assume too. That this is something from God for not just for him, but for his family, for his fathers, given at the time of the conquest, and has continued in the family line until now. And he's a trustee whose job it is to pass it on to his kids. And that's just part of being an Israelite. Uh, and he's not willing to break with that for money, even if even a lot of money, even something better. We're not told it was the greatest vineyard in the world, but it was his vineyard, the one God had given him. Well, and this is where things take a really bad turn. Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased. Sometimes I think the writer of Kings has fun with satire where Ahab is concerned. He always picks these wonderful words, heavy and displeased. Because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. He pouted. This is the king of Israel? Well, that's kind of what Jezebel says. Jezebel, his wife, came in and said to him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? He said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. Hmm. Mostly accurate, but he's pouting about it. 
Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thy heart be married. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Perk up, dear. Got you covered. I'll take care of this. You are the king, right? Well, you know, and in Israel, the king couldn't do stuff like this. It wasn't supposed to, at any rate. She was a Canaanite princess. Canaanite rulers did this all the time. So she knows exactly what has to happen. She does not tell her husband. But when her husband hears her say, I'll take care of it, this requires no great imagination to figure out what she has in mind. So, one, as king, he ought to know. Two, as her husband, he almost certainly does know. At least he knows it's going to be very shady. But he goes and eats, you know, his cornflakes or whatever, and it's, everything's fine. He's not <laughs> plausible deniability. He's not going to get involved. We'll just see what happens. Mm. So, she, Je uh, Jezebel, uh, wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal. See, he's now involved for sure. And sent the letters unto the elders and nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. Jezreel was the summer palace. Samaria was the main palace. But when things were a little warm, they would go to Jezreel. So she has contact with these people. Just sends, drops some letters and uh, which say this. And she wrote in the letter saying, proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. Have a... Have a a public fast to, and honor Naboth as a godly man who somehow needs to be honored because of whatever. He's, she's leaving them room for imagination to figure this one out. And set two men, sons of Belial. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> I want you to put up there two sons of Satan who can be trusted to do any kind of screwy criminal thing we want. Yes, ma'am. Got them. Pull out our list of sons of Belial, please. Um <laughs> The usual suspects. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, grab the usual suspects. Uh, set two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. Wow. Okay. Hmm. The men of his city, even the elders and the nobles who were uh, the inhabitants of the city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she had sent to them, they proclaimed a fast, they set Naboth on high among the people, and there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him, and the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. So we got two witnesses to a capital offense, and apparently no one stood up to protest or to defend Naboth. So with two witnesses and executioners ready, and they grab him, and they carry him out of the city, and they stone him with stones, and he dies. Apparently, at the same time, his sons were also executed, because later on we find a reference to that. But that's not the focus at the moment. Wow. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. Just in passing, I, I've been making a big deal now for a few years that the Bible relies upon uh, original source documents and eyewitness testimony wherever possible. It very rarely, very rarely does God simply drop information into people's heads. There, there may be a few times, but largely, especially in the New Testament, um, and, and Luke is a good example, uh, mm -hmm. the, the writers go, either they were there at the time or they go and interview people who were, or they quote public documents, genealogies, royal decrees, things like that. Who was the lame who left these letters lying around for someone to record? This is a, <laughs> this is a dumb system. Uh, yeah, this is like Watergate, only worse. It's, uh, it's <laughs> someone just, someone did not burn the letters when they well, should have. Actually, so this reminds me of like everything going on with the FBI lately. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's one thing to live in a country where corruption is going on under the hood all the time. It's another to live in a country where corruption is done openly <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and no one even tries to hide it. It's like, yeah. oh, yep, these letters are on public record uh, and nobody's going to do anything about it because that's yeah. how this, this place is right now. Yeah. Oy. Well, anyway, it came to pass when Jezebel heard that, or heard that Naboth was stoned and he was dead, that Jezebel said, Ahab... Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money. That's called a business transaction, Jezebel. And Nab for Naboth is not alive but dead. 
And they came to Vassal and Ahab heard that Naboth was dead. Then Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, to take possession of it. So he doesn't know anything, right? He's completely uninvolved. Um, there are any shading dealings he doesn't know about it. However, there is a God in heaven who sees the heart. The word of the Lord came unto Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise and go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he's in the vineyard of Naboth, whether he's go down to possess it. And thou shalt speak to him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall the dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? He gets such great lines. And he <laughs> answered, I found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, I will take away thy posterity, and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that shut up and left in Israel, and will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger, and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall Oof. of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. And there's a little bit more that we may come to or not. But notice that the prophet says in so many words, thou art the man. Not, yeah, your wife's a murderess, bring her out. Like, you 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 killed. Your authority, your guys, your wife, you knew. You are responsible. You ought to be executed. Of course, there's no one here to execute you. And God has not told me to do it. But... Um, Someone's going to do it. They're not going to take you out. They're going to take all your kids out because, it, you know, eye for eye, you tried to dispossess Ahab and his, or uh, Naboth and his heirs of what God had given them. So God's going to take away not simply your lands. He's going to take you away and your kids and their kids. And there's not going to be anybody left. He's going to take that wife of yours. She's gone. She's dog meat. Um, there's a God who rules in heaven and who does call men to account for their crimes sooner or later. And God does take an interest in private property and real estate that's been stolen. It was proper to call upon him for such things. There's um, one, one passing thing here. Uh, when the witnesses witnessed against the Naboth, they said, you blaspheme God and the king. Now, speaking evil of the king, mm. speaking, speaking evil of God are not the same thing. But it may explain how Naboth suddenly comes into possession. Uh, yes, it seems that Naboth's sons were eliminated, and that may be part of the whole picture, that there's probably more to the trial and the evidence that was brought forward than we know of. But if Naboth had, had in fact, spoken evil of the king, you, do not, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of thy people, you shall not blaspheme the gods who curse the gods, then that could put Ahab in the... Um, place of one who has been offended by the crime and who deserves restitution, and thus might constitute his minute claim to getting the land afterwards. But, you know, really, this whole thing's illegal. Who cares? He just went down and took the land. No one's going to stand up to him, possibly. Oh, wait, here's Elijah. Rats. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, any, if, a, if anyone has the um, willingness to mm. get in the way of Ahab's plans. It's Elijah. So <laughs> the the interesting I love that we don't really know that though. Like, did Elijah love that he was the guy <laughs> who always had to go up to Ahab and be like, dude? He seems like, he like the guy who would. Go I've gotta be honest. <laughs> like, I just imagine there's probably a, a slight annoyance. It's like that guy again, Lord. <laughs> but I also feel like there's a part of him that's like, uh, you know. It's been a while since I've gotten to tell him off. This is great. Let's do it in the name of the Lord. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. yeah. It's like the Batman facing the Joker again or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> interestingly enough, at the end, we're told that when Ahab heard these words, he rent his clothes, put sackcloth upon his flesh, fasted, and lay in sackcloth 
and went softly. Went softly? <laughs> what does that mean? I don't know what that means. He means he was quiet and meek, I suppose, in his behavior and didn't slam doors. I don't... I, it's mocking. <laughs> the away. writer is mocking him here. There's no doubt about that. It's just... He tiptoed away. That's what Yeah, that's what it means. And But interestingly enough, God took this as meaning something. Not a lot, but something. Because God honors history and our <laughs> actions within history, even when they're far from perfect and far from making up for the bad things, God notices when we at least act out the role of repentance. And he says to Elijah, see now how... Ahab humbleth himself before me. Because he humbles himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring evil upon his house. Well, you know, that sounds good and all, but the next chapter Ahab dies in battle. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, Lord. Um, so, he won't live to see it. Oh, because he's not living much longer. All right, that works. Uh, and, and, and so, there's the story. And uh, it, it centers on this idea that somehow the state well, it doesn't actually, because even Ahab knew that you shouldn't just go steal your people's property. Israel, in its apostasy, during the time it worshipped Baal, they still the state was still not in the position where it could simply come and take your land without some kind of legal pretext. Israel, at its worst, was still not so bad as to simply take its people's property. But some legal trickery, some judicial games, a little judicial murder, yeah, they were up for that. And God calls them on the carpet. There is a just God who presides over the affairs of men, who does see and does hear and does judge. When you think of uh, Hannah's song at the beginning of Samuel and, and Mary's song, mm -hmm. Magnificat, mm -hmm. one of the things that they both appeal to as, as, as will be accomplished in the coming of Messiah is that the Messiah will establish judgment and justice. He will bring down those who are oppressors. He will exalt those of low degree. He will act in history to turn things upside down and bring down the scoundrels, though they are wealthy and powerful, and to put his people eventually into positions of power. So here we just have one, one simple example. And of course, we're not done yet, because Ahab dies, and the kingdom goes to his son for a little while. And then Elijah gets pulled off the scene, and Elisha takes over, and we're going to come to these stories shortly. Um, and one of remember that Elijah was given three chores. Uh, at Sinai. One was to anoint the next prophet, which he's, which he's done, Elisha. But then he's supposed to anoint Jehu, king of Israel. Jehu's not in the royal line. He's not a descendant of Ahab. In other words, he's going to authorize regicide and revolution. And it's coming real, real soon. So, this, this is the God we serve. He is not meek, mild, timid, afraid to say boo to us. He will do what he needs to do to enforce his law, and he will do it ultimately in eternity as we stand before the throne of the Lamb, the white throne judgment. But he will do it also in history. He will overturn and overturn to establish the power and kingdom of his son and to protect his people. Mm -hmm. I think just a, a reaffirmation of, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about rights, in in some sense anyway mm -hmm. i mean that's 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 the that's the language that is used for these um moral issues in american law mm -hmm. well english and, law is yeah no yeah it, common law uh broadly speaking <laughs> and it really does come down to sort of layers of authority scopes of authority mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. it's you know you have been given something by God. It is yours. It is something he has given to you in, in the due course of providence. Um, above that, there are varying levels of authority that determine what you are allowed to do with that. Um, there's the law of God. There's the law of the state. But there are laws that determine what the state is allowed to do. Mm -hmm. in regards to that property as well and it's just a uh an annoying an annoyance i think <laughs> uh that the state does not always adhere to what it even says about its own law that it mm. feels free to flout it uh at its own convenience to 
you know, when we were going over some of the American case laws uh, regarding eminent domain, I just kept thinking about, well, you know, what if the state is the one who has the power to determine the value of the land? How is this not a conflict of interest? A <laughs> an example of what the Bible calls mm-hmm. unjust weights and measures. Mm, that may yes. not be the exact term, but you know, the, the false yeah, weights yeah, and measures. Absolutely. And it's it's really unconscionable to essentially say, well, this agency that wants to do things with your land also is the one who is determining what they're going to pay you for it Mm -hmm. and are also forcing you to accept those terms at gunpoint, metaphorically or literally. And the person who is on the receiving end of that basically has no recourse. And especially mm. since 2000, uh, 2005, whenever the the first case law you mentioned uh, mm-hmm. came about, there's there's not even the highest court in the land technically is allowed to overrule that decision because it is based on past precedent. No. Yeah. Well, um, they could reverse it. They could. They, they, they could. They do reverse they, things. Yeah, but they would have to demonstrate that it was a, on a faulty legal reason. Basis. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned gunpoint as being perhaps figurative, but you know what? If it's you try fine. to stay on that land and you handcuff yourself to it, or you hold up in it with a gun, it stops becoming figurative real fast. They will yeah. mm-hmm. dispossess you by by police or military means, because yeah. in their minds, it's not yours anymore. You are now stealing from them. When they have the right to remove you, and presumably they'll be nice about it, but if you're going to start pulling guns on them, well, things to be you. Um, <sighs> this, um, you know, this we we we've used the the, the phrase gunpoint. It's we're not. This is not hyperbole. No, nope. this has happened nope. over and over again. Yeah, and I I also think too, and maybe this is getting a little bit more controversial, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you you hear about stories, you know, people, somebody who lives on a farm in the middle of Nebraska, and they're like, well, we're actually going to build a highway through your land, so Mm. we're dispossessing you. But there's also, uh, I hesitate to put like the full force of my reasoning behind this, because I I, (laughs) I don't have any examples on hand to pull from. But, you know, inner cities where the the supposed uh, minorities that uh, the state supposedly cares so much about mm-hmm. are the ones who are being dispossessed of their property as well, and saying, "Well, no, this is a uh, sorry, this is uh, something we're putting in for the the New York Jets, so or the Nets, whatever the was Nets area in this was. case because it's basketball, the <laughs> Nets, Nets basketball, right? Yeah. Not the Jets. <laughs> We've just lost all the sports fans; they're not listening anymore. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but yeah, it's like you know, pick. Pick what what your standard is. Do you care about these people, or does that stop when you think there's something better? And mm-hmm. it becomes more egregious when essentially the argument is, oh, people have been racist in positions of power for the past 150, 200, 300, however many years they're saying, and we need to do our part to stop that. But we're still going to take your land in case we think it's valuable to us. <laughs> right. <laughs> Because you do, you shouldn't be living in la- in houses like this. These are rodent infested. Uh, they they it's ought still to be condemned. <laughs> um, and um, we'll give you we'll give you money equal to and maybe a little above uh, market value for living in a slum because that's a lot. And I'm sure you can go and you can find a better place to live. And we've done you a favor in the name of humanitarianism and love for the poor. And go thou and be warmed and filled. Uh, okay, where am I going to go? Fan. Mm-mm. Where am I going to yeah, this- go? How am I going to uh, move my belongings to another place? Mm-hmm. Uh, especially if you're in a city like in New York, no one has a car. Like three yeah. people have a car <laughs> in New York City, and the rest are yeah. taxis. And yeah. yet, um, the streets are filled with them. <laughs> yeah. Out of towners, New Jerseys. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. that was. That, th- those are all the sort of thoughts percolating in my head. It, it is is that it is it is very much a um, hypocritical mm-hmm. set mm-hmm. of uh, policies and actions that they're taking. And actually, I was I I found something earlier today, and it was about 
Chicago affordable housing. Some mm-hmm. somebody who's a politician in Chicago shared this letter that she received like that week. She said, um, in 1993, she applied for affordable housing. And last week she got a letter saying she'd been moved up the list. <laughs> and um, a, that just goes to show how much uh, the government cares about the poor. Uh, but secondly, the person who shared this uh, then uh, drew the inference that the the real error, the real cause, the real problem here was the disease of capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, In capitalism, I audibly laughed. You get, yeah. <laughs> it's because of capitalism that you are hopefully not as poor as you were in 1993. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But it's like, you know, cap it's it's the st- the straw man of it all capitalism is when the government does a thing that's bad <laughs> no it's not <laughs> yeah honestly <laughs> and it does it because there are rich people in the world so there uh, right because they exist that yeah i mean there, there's something to be said about you know rich people buying political influence in some sense but like, ah but that's not capitalism yeah and we just talked it, about so how <laughs> Yeah, we just talked about how rich people buying land at a premium or at a very much non-premium and building a sports stadium seems a little yeah. unjust. <laughs> very much. And <laughs> they're doing soul. it not with the power and influence that their money has in and of itself, you know, the the political not the political, the um personal influence that they have as a charismatic person perhaps. They have co-opted the sword of the state and said, I yeah. want you to help me, <laughs> let me out. Borrow here, that man. for a second. <laughs> yeah. Let me borrow that. Can you lend me your um, police department on a, perhaps a lend lease kind of situation going on here and said, <laughs> yeah, get out. Cause I, I have a stadium to build. I have high rises that I want to put in this area and your slum is, is in the way of that plan. It's like, that doesn't, mm-hmm. it's not good. And and a lot of the time, I think too, it's yeah, it's the same kind of. We're not in favor. <laughs> no, we are very sarcastic uh, about this. <laughs> but like, I also uh, anyway, that's that's the last I'll say. But we're running out of time. Um, in, in other words, when theft is theft, no matter who's doing it. But let's go. end on that kind of um, <laughs> ag- agreeing. Yeah, point, I think <laughs> that that kind of controversial statement that we controversial. Love to- you know, the Ten Commandments applies Stare to everyone. Stir up hornets' nests. Same. All right. <laughs> so, um, do we have recommendations tonight? I got one. Thanks to some things you just said. Uh, there is a book called "The Myth of the Robber Barons." Hey, by Ooh, Professor. excellent. Yes. And I just found out by googling it that he, the author Burton W. Folsom, taught at Gerald School, or still teaches there, Hillsdale. Yes, he retired, actually. Yes, oh, I, okay. I had the privilege of taking uh, History of American Economics with him. Uh, he's a wonderful professor and a very cheery individual. <laughs> well, The Myth of the Robber Barons has been on our required reading list as, as an, alternate, uh, an alternate for for decades. I don't know if anyone's ever read it. Probably a couple of people have. The subtitle is A New Look at the Rise of Big Business in America. The basic idea is uh, sort of what we've been talking about, that these... There, there were two sorts of 19th century capitalists who are often tarred as robber barons. Some were not capitalists at all. They simply bought and sold votes and got power from the government. Others didn't. And with their two hands <laughs> yeah. and the blessing of God, they built financial empires. Um, but the thing in the background is not a, even the the slimy stuff would not have worked had there not been a healthy free market American economy to play off of. Uh, and he talks about some of the um, specific players at the time, Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, uh, Schwab, and others. Uh, and I have uh, both the book and I have a uh, a shrunk down article based on the book that I do assign in my uh, economics class. For those of you who have been told that. Uh, Rich businessmen are always evil, and it's all the fault of capitalism. Well, yes, many businessmen are in fact evil, small and large, but it's not capitalism that got them there. It's socialism, actually. And um, 
there are some people who got there without being robbers and without being socialists. They actually work the American system and raise them up themselves up from nothing to being multimillionaires they, because the American system allows for that. If you're going to work really, really hard. value. Yeah. So that's my recommendation for now. Cool. Emily? Emily? I'm just reminiscing about Dr. Folsom's class now. This was such a good time. <laughs> he had this bell, like a little um, countertop service bell. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when we, we would talk about the 1920s, and he's like, you know, this is going great. This is going great. Prosperity everywhere. And then we get to the 1930s and the whole New Deal. And he would give the bell to a student in the class and said, when things get too awful and FDR crosses too many lines and you can't take it anymore, <laughs> ring this bell and we'll take a break and I'll tell you about a great entrepreneur. <laughs> so, That's was, great. It was beautiful. <laughs> I love that. Um, my recommendation for tonight, um, I think I already recommended another book by Dr. Folsom, Uncle Sam Can't Count, um, mm. <laughs> which is just a collection of stories about entrepreneurs in America who succeeded uh, by overcoming the obstacles of crony capitalism, of mm. their opponents who were getting subsidies and who were leveraging their political influence. Mm -hmm. um, so I've already recommended that, so I won't recommend it again. Um, instead, I will recommend cooking with gas. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Because yes. gas stoves are so great, and I really look forward to when we are moved. We, we're moving, and we're having a gas stove in our new place. <laughs> I'm excited about it. <laughs> oh, are you are you moving from the, the place you're currently in? Yes. Yeah, we're, <laughs> well, we're currently in an apartment. Um, oh, I, I see the place into the you home bought. That we purchased. Yes. Thank you. I was very confused. <laughs> I thought you were currently in the place you had purchased, and I was like, "You're moving again? You bought another <laughs> place?" <laughs> I was very <laughs> yeah, not yet out of it. We got some work to do on it before we get there. Oh, okay, that's good. You know, I will I will recommend the audiobook that I'm currently listening to, but it's um, as far as I know, it's also a should be a print book as well. Um, it's called Lost Boy by Christina Henry. And essentially, I, I still have a third of the book left, so I can't quite say anything about the um, conclusion uh, or denouement or anything like that. But essentially, it takes the premise of Peter Pan and the Lost Boys and asks the question, why exactly is Peter the hero? <laughs> think about what he does like and it, you know th there there was some kind of post on the internet that i saw a while ago that was like if you think about peter pan for like two seconds you'll realize he is a fairy who kidnaps children <laughs> yes yes he should be terrifying and uh th this one is definitely bringing that out and also uh it, 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 it i will say it is very violent uh, if that is something you're sensitive to, maybe skip this book. Uh, there's some graphic <laughs> descriptions of horrible deaths. Um, but it is, it's like, well, what happens when you take people who are 11, 12, 13, sometimes as young as seven, uh, to an island where pirates are and where alligators live and mermaids regularly try to drown people? You know, people die. And... Yeah. That's not a good thing. <laughs> uh, let it be known, the author of this book and I and probably all the people on this podcast uh, agree, dying is bad. <laughs> uh, so Lost Boy by Christina Henry. It's been an excellent read. It's kind of, there are moments of um, psychological insight uh, to the main character who um, I figured out who he is supposed to be and I will not tell you for spoilers. So, so this is this is fiction then? Fiction, yes, one hundred. It's not literary analysis per se. It's no, it, it's more like it, it's a fictional retelling. Retelling, it, it's like okay. A, it's set up like a prequel to the Peter Pan story okay. that we know. Oh, okay, um, and it it's just saying like, look, we've seen the Disney movie. <laughs> I don't know if that's the best way to analyze the details that we know. Um, so it, it is sort of a, an analysis in a lo very loose sense of the term, but it's, uh, it is a fictional story. It's a good fictional story. It has a narrative that I'm really enjoying. 
And they actually really set up Peter as a cunning manipulator, mm. narcissist, yes. you know, all, all the buzzwords that you could imagine. Um, and they do a very good job of making you not like him, which... Yeah, it requires no effort on my part. Well, yeah, <laughs> You're right. Sure. He steals children from the nursery and they never come home again. That's um, the one exception of the nice story that we get told. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, it, it, it's a very good book. I'm, I, I am enjoying it. Like I said, it's very violent, so be aware of that. But yeah, it's a good book. Okay, I may, I may have to read that soon. Summer's coming. I have time. There we go. Well, uh, I think that's a good place to call it quits. So thank you, Greg and Emily, for joining me and for the, the good conversation about theft being theft. <laughs> what God thinks of it. Um Thank you to our listeners for joining us for this episode. We really appreciate you uh, downloading the episode and listening to it with us. If you'd like to follow us, you can do so uh, on our YouTube channel, on Rumble. You can like our Facebook page and see, well, there's not much memes going on right now, but eventually there will be. (laughs) And if uh, you'd like to subscribe to us, you can do so through any of the podcast catchers that are out there. If you'd like to email us, uh, you can do so at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. If you have questions for us, we'd be happy to answer them. Um, You can also support us at anchor.fm forward slash haltingtowardszion. Thank you to those people who have decided to support us financially. You help us get these episodes out to you. And finally, thanks to David Maxson as well for doing that editing and for helping out as much as you do. You're an awesome, awesome addition to the team. We look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great one.